Good morning. Uh, this is the lecture for March 31st, the last day of March. And um, this is my house. I actually built this house two years ago. And this is where I'm sort of so self-isolating. And I do have lots of windows here, so I kind of like that. I'm kind of out in the country outside here in Danville. So it is March 31st and here we are in the log cabin with the blackboard that I was in last time and uh, we are going to talk about your documentary project that's your final project. In these days of self-isolation it is a little hard to maybe think about doing uh, a story about a third party person or a place. Sometimes my students in the past would do documentaries about coffee shops or bicycle shops or you know where they were doing something interesting. Uh, but maybe by mid-April, there might be some return to normalcy. We'll see. I hope you guys are safe and happy and healthy wherever you are. Um, but, you know, if, if there was some return to normalcy, maybe you could do a third-party public, a third-party person or a place or a thing um, outside of yourself. Now, if things don't change, and it, maybe you could do more of a personal diary about your own reactions to you're obsessed with watching the Netflix show Ozarks and you're going to document your obsession or maybe it's a, a, a personal documentary about you're dealing with this strange isolation period um, so you could use yourself um, so last uh, time I put these uh, five elements that are the visual elements of a documentary up and um, they were the talking head, the B-roll, the creative B-roll, the archive, and the graphics. But today I'm going to talk about the talking head. And I'm going to talk about framing shots and doing professional, so-called professional interview techniques. Uh, oh, also I talked last time about the structure. There's often an opening tease, then you go to the beginning of your story, what's happening now, and then an ending. So um, that was last week. But... Uh, Today, we are going to talk about talking heads and how to shoot uh, what is the anchor and bedrock of a documentary, which is the human being and the human voice telling what's going on in their world. Um, and in order for us to, in order for me to get you to think about some techniques for shooting your talking head, uh, I did find a few tutorials that seem to talk about this and how to professionally frame your subjects. And let's look at a few of those, okay? Um, so the first one is how to shoot an interview, and it's put out by uh, b &H Photo, which is in New York City, and b &H sells a lot of video cameras and a lot of lighting and a lot of sound and electronic equipment. So of course they wanted to put out a, a video on how to shoot an interview. Let's see what they have to say. Hey gang, Chase here, and today we're going to be discussing interviews. Now, interviews are one of the most common types of shoots that you'll be asked to do, but nailing them isn't always easy, so we've come up with seven simple steps that will help keep your interview shoot running smoothly. There are several things you should consider when assessing the environment so that you can make the most of it. First, does the space even fit the look and feel of your piece? If you can, try to use surroundings to help you tell the story. There are also some practical concerns to address. Does your location's look change at all? Things like sunlight coming through windows or clocks framed in your shot are things that are constantly changing and can cause continuity issues in your final piece. Distracting audio in the environment can also ruin an interview, so consider the ambient noise of the space that you're in. Things like an air conditioner turning on and off, loud traffic outside, or even a plane passing overhead are things that can dominate a sound bite or ruin an edit between two clips. Next, consider if you have enough floor space to work properly. Keep in mind that you'll be packing cameras, lights, crew, and your subject into the location. Do you have enough room to separate your subject from the background that they're in front of? Can the height of the ceilings accommodate your lights? All important things to consider. Investigating the power situation is very important. Ensure that there are sufficient outlets to run your equipment from. I always like to have stingers so that I can reach outlets in a different area and power strips and triple taps so that I can multiply the outlets that I have. Just remember to tape the cables to the ground so that no one trips over them. Also, be aware of the building's circuitry. Other buildings, for example, may not be well suited for the amount of power that studio lights draw 
and you could blow a circuit. Blowing a circuit is always something to keep in mind, so try to have an idea of where you can find that fuse box should you need to get to it. So, for the purposes of this video, we'll be shooting in a studio, which has everything we need for a proper interview, and will help us illustrate the remaining steps a little better. Once you have your space, the next step is to compose your main shot. Now, there are a million different ways to compose your shot, way too many to cover in a short video. So let's take a look at the shot we're setting up here and discuss our approach. Now, whether we're wider to reveal more background or in tight to capture an intimate moment, we always wanna frame the subject to the opposite side that they're looking. Here you can see the subject is framed left with look room to the right to establish the subject's eye line. Try to have your interviewer sit right next to the camera. This keeps your subject looking just off to the side. Too far to the side can look awkward. Another option would be to have the subject look directly into the camera, which can help immerse the viewer and give the impression that the subject is speaking directly to them. And so I think this documentary promo is good when it talks about uh, the basics of, uh, you know, don't have an air conditioner going uh, when you're shooting your interviews. Um, I think it's good when it talks about the framing and the eye line, and it talks about, you know, dividing your frame up into thirds. You know, they seem to say that if you were shooting a subject looking at the camera, you might put him in the center if, if they are looking at the camera. And if they were looking at an interviewer, they would definitely be over on the third. You know, I, I, I kind of like the rule of thirds, and I, I like to put interviews into this third space, even if they're talking to me, even if they're talking to the camera. But I thought that was interesting. Put them center if they're looking at the camera. Put them in a third if they're looking slightly off camera toward the interviewer. I thought that was a good, good thing here. We've set the camera height at eye level because it's a good neutral base. You could shoot down on the subject to help hide a double chin, or use that angle creatively to make them appear weak or small. You could shoot up at a subject to hide a shiny bald spot, or use that creatively to portray them as powerful or domineering. Next, we compose the shot so that the background works for us and is pleasing. It's just a plain black background with no extraneous light on it. If you have a background that's distracting and competes with your subject, you may want to pull the subject further away from it to create more depth throwing it out of focus. You know, they talk about the background being distracting. I think that is so much the key. I think choosing your background is hugely important um, because if it is busy, if it's distracting, it takes away from the focus which is supposed to be the human face. Running a second camera during an interview can be extremely helpful later in the edit room. A good rule of thumb that I use is to offset my B camera about 30 degrees from my main angle to make the cuts between the two feel seamless. But going as far to the side as a profile can still be effective. Ensure that both your camera settings are matched up and you're all good to go. The standard approach to lighting interviews is known as three-point lighting. It's by no means the only way to light an interview, but it's a great place to begin. Three-point lighting, as the name suggests, consists of three points of light. You have the key light, which is your main source of illumination. You have the fill, which controls the contrast on your subject by filling in the shadows created by the key. As you can see, the fill doesn't always have to be a light. It could be something that bounces light. And lastly, the backlight, or edge light, helps separate your subject from the background. There are a variety of tools you can use that can help you shape and model these lights. Softboxes, silks, and pieces of diffusion can be added to a light to spread and soften the beam. These are very common go-to for key lights in interviews because they create a softer look on the face. Flags, or cutters, allow us to block the light off of certain areas. Great for cutting excess light off the background, for example. Most bounce boards actually have a black side as well, which can be used for negative fill. Let's say you're in a very bright room that's bouncing light everywhere. Use some negative fill to control it. Nets are cloth scrims that reduce the intensity of a source without diffusing it. Very helpful if you can't move your light any further back, but you need to weaken its intensity. And of course, there's all manner of color gels to help color correct to the look you're going for. Sometimes I like to put a little bit of blue on my edge light just to make a little difference in the lighting. And finally, there are reflectors and bounce boards, which can be very useful as subtle fill, like we're using here. You know, I think a lot of you are gonna be shooting these projects on your iPhones, 
Um, and so even this discussion about a second camera is not really relevant, but you know, they, they had some good techniques about the second camera. And then when it comes to lighting, uh, they talk about the three points of lighting. Um, and those are a key light, a fill, and a backlight. And this is true in every professional interview that I've ever been a part of. Uh, if it's done by a, a Wrigley Media or, you know, a, a, a TV network, they always have a key light, a fill, and a backlight. And the key light is what comes in on the face. The fill is just ambient fill. And then they always have a backlight for separation. Now, you might not be using as many lights. You know, you might be using your smartphone and you kind of, uh, have to find a place to shoot. Uh, one of the words they use in their lighting techniques that I like to use is soft light. Um, every one of these tutorials is going for an interview is going to bring in some sort of diffused material over a light to do, diffuse the light and make it softer. You can get that same effect if you put your subjects next to a window or curtains. You know, soft light from a window is excellent light to light a subject. Um, let me give you a little clue too. The key light is supposed to be at 45 degrees and it's supposed to leave a little triangle of light on the opposite cheek. Key light coming in from over there, the nose is going to create a shadow that has a little upside down triangle. That's a cinematographer's little trick. One great strategy is to split your audio channels between a lav and a shotgun. That way you can get a stereo signal, but if one mic fails, you're still covered. All right, now this step is short and sweet, but it's a step that's overlooked by many filmmakers today. Do a sound and picture test. That should always be the last thing that you do before you actually start rolling your interview. If you record 30 seconds of video and 30 seconds of audio, you can play them back and make sure that there's no issues with your equipment. Also, you might catch something. Sometimes things like water bottles, sea stands, shadows, or boom mics can appear in your shot and you never know it until you pull it onto your computer and take a closer look. In regard to the audio discussed in this little tutorial, you know, they're using the best cameras and they're saying use a shotgun mic pointed at the mouth plus a lavalier. I think a lot of you guys are doing the project solo, I think everyone is, so most likely you're going to be recording from that mic on the camera and that's okay. Just make sure it's very close to your subject, that's the best audio possible. But, you, you know, you should know if you work for Wrigley Media and you're a sound person, they are going to kind of boom a mic uh, that's a short shotgun or a shotgun and then they're probably also dual lavalier and that gives them, that gives them two different kinds of sounding mics and that's a professional way to do it. Yo, what's going on guys? Today we're talking about interviews and how to shoot them on any budget and with any location. So today I've got my buddy Casey McBeth. Casey McBeth is an amazing cinematographer that has shot some of the biggest interviews in the world. Tell them about some of the interviews. I work a lot on the Oscars and the Golden Globes. I've shot interviews for George Takei, Kristen Stewart, Steve Carell, Christian Bale. What's step number one? <laughs> um, so step number one, whenever you walk into a location is obviously to figure out where you're going to shoot. Um, the things that you want to try to keep in mind are how to keep it visually interesting, usually by having depth in the frame. Obviously, you've picked a wonderfully challenging location. I chose the most ugly location you could ever possibly shoot, the warehouse here at the office. We're trying to make it hard. So no windows here. We have to light everything from scratch. So what are you looking for when we're trying to figure out where can we set our frame? To be honest, the first thing I do is I look for what I don't want to be in the frame. If we turn around here, this entire wall, it's very naturally dark. No amount of light is going to change that. What's wrong with this location over here? There's nothing that could be useful here for the business owner that we have. Okay, how about this side? What do we got going over here? We have a bathroom going on over <laughs> here. However, she did mention a coffee shop. You've got some microwaves. You've got some coffee machines over here. And we've also got a doorway. We can keep that doorway open. We can get some depth with the tables that are already in place. Not only does that give us a great area to stage set decoration, but that's also lots of leading lines that can help bring the eye back to the talent. The things I like about this tutorial that they say is, again, don't have a busy background. Don't have the background just distracting your eye. He discusses leading lines, and I'm a big believer in this, uh, that if you have a diagonal uh, line behind that leads to the human face, the diagonals will draw your eye 
to the subject. And like, for instance, here's some examples in my prison films where I would try to have diagonal lines behind the subject. Uh, here's a diagonal line uh, from the chairs for this actor. Um, I always look for diagonals. That's Robbie's little secret technique. Uh, Going about the framing is to have her on the left third of the camera. Mm -hmm. So if you were to vertically cut this frame into thirds, you'd have her on the left side, so we have more lean room on the right side of the frame. It's what we're kind of used to seeing when people are being kind of portrayed a little bit more glamorously. And then as far as headspace goes, which is the amount of room between the top of the frame and their head, I try to go with what seems like between maybe three to four fingers above their head. Mm -hmm. So that way it's not too crowded and it's not too far away. Okay. If it's too crowded, it instinctually makes people start feeling a little bit more- Claustrophobic. Claustrophobic, a little bit more nervous and like there's more weight to the scene than you want. And if it's too far, the person, first of all, looks short, which yeah. is a very unattractive thing and all actors will freak out. But also it just, it makes the frame feel like it's swimming around a little too much and they're just kind of lost in it. And the worst thing that I see a lot of people doing is they'll do this. They'll just give them a little haircut. Oh my and God. It looks yeah. so bad. Wow. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. No haircuts. Typically I try to avoid having laps in the frame. If somebody's sitting, it's not a particularly attractive place to focus on anyways. It just closed bunch up. It just looks awkward. Try to pay attention to where the subject is in relation to the rest of the background. A lot of times if there's plants or whatnot, you don't want them right behind somebody's head. I think this works a lot of the time for beams or things like that. Make sure they aren't poking out of the actor's head. Mm -hmm. Plants, make sure they aren't poking out of their head. I feel like if we add some color to this, then we can kind of help increase kind of not only the focus on our character, but just help separate her further. The only thing I'm seeing now is kind of that strip that we have her in is looking really great. The rest though is pretty dull. <laughs> Because yeah. <laughs> it's a great location. For I'm lack picked. of a better term. Yep. I'm seeing a couple of little lamps already on set and we can use those as practicals. I think by adding some pops of light could go a long way into kind of making this location not look like this location. <laughs> so real quick for people that don't know, a practical light is a light that you put in the actual frame of the camera so that it actually adds a little more visual interest, makes things look a little more interesting. And you can also use them for motivation for the lights that you're using. Absolutely. Not necessarily always important for an interview, but sometimes it's really neat. Cool. It's pretty darn good. Yeah. I have to say, they're setting up this interview and it's really not that interesting. Of course, the backgrounds that they had to choose were inside this square uh, production facility and there's nothing that looks really too good in there. But, I, you know, they're talking about all this light that they're doing, but I think the background in this tutorial ended up too busy and I would not say it's a, you know, an A-plus visual interview. Here's some interesting stuff that when they talk about the tracking genie that they use and these kinds of equipment, pieces of equipment are becoming cheaper now. Uh, I'm actually, actually coveting having one or maybe eventually buying one because, you know, I think they're, you know, several hundreds of dollars and they can do these kinds of tracking shots. So in this case, we are using the Syrup Genie 2. This is a motorized slider that we're gonna be using for that dynamic second angle. Uh, the Syrup Genie 2 and the Magic Carpet are basically just gonna bring up the production value of this shoot. Uh, we've tested it before. I love how silent it is, as well as how easy it is to set up. Basically, when you normally use this kind of gear, you have to sacrifice for the sake of portability, but it's not the case with the Syrup Genie 2 and the Magic Carpet. Both are super small and lightweight. So right here for our second camera, we are using the Canon EOS R. Again, it is a kind of affordable DSLR camera. The reason why we're using two Canon cameras is from the same manufacturer, you're looking to have a lot more similar and matching color science, which is gonna make your post life so much easier. So right now, just to be able to get the same consistent motion back and forth, we've yeah. got the Genie set on bounce. Okay. And all that's gonna do is gonna run that same keyframe animation forwards and backwards until we tell it to stop. It's so it's the, the perfect, perfect worker. It's the perfect second shooter. Yeah. And this is all the kind of thing that you could fit into a backpack if need be. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, all it really is is your support. It's the slider itself. And then yeah. everything's built in here and we're just using an app to control it. Yeah. And this right here is all built in battery too. So really not a problem there. Here's a little aside. Um, I happened to come upon a production being shot for a reality TV show in my local coffee shop about three weeks ago. It was right before social isolation. Actually, it was just barely right before social isolation. 
And um, there was a Food Network crew down from Toronto to shoot reality TV about a local bakery that had had a makeover for this makeover food channel show. And uh, so I, I had the opportunity to videotape, like any bystander, what they were doing. And uh, just like what you saw in the tutorial about the remote genie tracking, the Food Network did an interview, sit-down interview with two people, and they used three cameras. They had, you know, the over-the-shoulder of on one person camera. They had the over-the-shoulder on the other person camera. And then they had this tracking shot on what I believe is a Dana dolly um, that kept moving back and forth a as a two-shot. So um, this is considered standard professional setup for a two-person interview for TV. And then I asked the cameraman when he was, you know, stopping to get a cup of coffee if I if I could ask him some questions about how a person becomes a network camera person. And here's what he had to say. Yeah. So I'm talking to Adam, who was shooting a reality TV show in my local coffee shop. Uh, how are you doing, Adam? Good, thanks. Um, so you are shooting a, a camera for this show. How did you become a cameraman for a reality TV show? Uh, I went to film school for it, but uh, on weekends, even during when I was studying, um, I was just volunteering on short films and small shoots, um, which was actually the way that I met more people in the industry, which I think was a bigger help to me than actually than, than the program I was in. Did you have to go to a city that had a lot of media to advance your career? What city was that? Yeah, I luckily grew up in Toronto and there's a ton of stuff happening. So there's lots of uh, like social media groups, which I would suggest joining any film groups in your area. Because um, oftentimes it's a pool of uh, it's a pool of freelancers that are kind of, you know, everyone needs help when they're starting out. So they'll book calls for small shoots like, hey, I'm shooting a music video or a short film this weekend. I'm looking for a camera assistant or a PA. Um, I would just say any time, any free time you got, even while you're in school, um, just volunteer. Do a couple. Um, try and make connections with people who you think can teach you things or you get along with. Um, and then just be an open book to them and, and try and work as hard as you can because then they'll hire you for real. Right. Uh, it seems like when you shoot these shows, you have a certain pattern that you follow. Like I saw you were doing an interview with a, uh, a, a dolly wide shot and then two over the shoulders. Is that kind of standard? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, always get the safe wide uh, so the editors can cut back to it and then get an over the shoulder on each side to cut in any uh, important moments. And then they had you lag behind. What are you doing here, uh, lagging behind with your camera? I'm just shooting some B-roll of the location, okay. which again, is good for the editors. If they need to cut away from the conversation for a second, they can splash that in. Well, I appreciate that. You did say uh, for what students should do to become a cameraman. Um, uh, or do you like what you do? Love it. It's always something new, always traveling. It's, it's awesome. I'm gonna be the interviewer today. Biggest mistakes to avoid as an interviewer, first of all, you want to be quiet. A lot of times we're used to talking to somebody, so when they say something, we're like, damn, that's crazy, or wow, okay, mm -hmm. awful for the audio. Okay. So you wanna just let people roll, give nonverbal cues, because it is a conversation that you're just recording. The second thing that you wanna do is everybody gets very excited once they know somebody's about to finish speaking, and they go, Oh, that's great. So you just want to make sure that whenever you're speaking to somebody and you're giving them just that gap to finish. So that way you can have nice, clear audio. Another one, and this one is always really difficult. Continually remind your subject to repeat the question that you've asked them in their answer. So if you say, what did you have for breakfast? A lot of people say bacon and eggs. But if you just cut out that thing, it's just a weirdo in a chair saying bacon and eggs. <laughs> so if you try to remind them, hey, you know, just say, oh, this morning for breakfast, I had bacon and eggs. It will make the interview process of editing a lot simpler and more informative to whoever's watching it. All right, are you ready to do this? This is a good point about repeating the question. Um, now, when it comes to interviewing your subject, I feel like there's like two different schools of thought. One is if it's a professional interview, if it's a promo interview, if you're trying to, to convey information to sell a product like Wrigley Media does, um, then, then you have to 
come in very quickly and then get pull sound bites out of the subject. So one of the techniques they say in this tutorial is, can you have your subject repeat the question? Um, you know, and the question might be, um, tell me what you do here at your business. And then the person would say, what I do here at the business is I, I manufacture widgets and we are the best widget manufacturer in the world. You know, or you might say, uh, tell me where you were born. And then they would repeat the question. I was born in Danville, Kentucky in Ephraim McDowell Hospital. So when you get them to repeat the question, what you are ensuring yourself that you can do is come up with a complete sound bite. You know, what doesn't work in a documentary is, uh, say, uh, where were you born? And if the subject says Danville, Kentucky, you know, you can't really cut in Danville, Kentucky. You know, supposing you have a shot of, of me walking as B-roll, and then I say Danville, Kentucky. But, you know, if I repeated the question, you could have a shot of me walking in B-roll and say, I was born in Danville, Kentucky. Um... So that's a technique, particularly if you have a limited amount of time. Sometimes if you have plenty of time and there's kind of a soft, uh, user-friendly way of interviewing where you just spend a lot of time with the subject and you roll a lot of tape, and eventually you will end up with some sound bites. But uh, you do need complete sentences for sound bites, particularly if it's a professional promo or if it's a professional documentary. Uh, in my prison film, I developed a, a, a technique that I used that worked pretty well in prison. I only had a limited amount of time to come into the prison. They said, I, you can only be here for two hours. And I've got to pull these great interviews out of some of the subjects. So what I did was beforehand, I had them write down the story of their life and how they got incarcerated on a sheet of paper. And then I had them read that. And I knew that that would give me good voiceover. So, for instance, here's one of my subjects who's basically just reading the story of his life off a sheet of paper. My name is Andrew Phillips. I'm 29 years old. I was conceived in violence. My father forced himself on my mother and got her pregnant. I was raised in the home of the innocents, an orphanage in Louisville, Kentucky. but I was able to use that for voiceover. You know, and then I actually even filmed some of them reading their statement and it was so compelling. In this section, I kept the subject, I kept his actual reading of his personal story on a sheet of paper into the segment. I fled and threw the gun away. I wasn't apprehended until like three years later. I was charged with murder, robbery, and tampering with physical evidence. Also with this technique, what I was able to do, I, I would have them read, you know, I was born in Danville, Kentucky. Uh, I went to Danville High School, you know, ba 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 And they would read it once and I would have it for voiceover. And then I would say, could you put down this sheet of paper and tell me the same thing that you wrote? So they would put down the sheet of paper and they'd say, I was born in Danville, Kentucky, in Ephraim McDowell Hospital. My parents were Eben Henson and Charlotte Henson. And they could kind of read, they could kind of remember what they had just read. Um, my name is Romello Rice. I'm a 19-year-old father of one. I got three brothers and four sisters. I got here, I got locked up when I was 16 on the charge of murder and robbery first degree. And I got convicted at the age of 17 on a 20-year sentence, 85% mandatory. And that gave me full sound bites uh, because a full sound bite is, you know, so important as opposed to Danville, Kentucky. You know, where are we now? Prison. So you need complete sentences. And I've just told you the best way to, to sort of pull it out of them. One, have them repeat the question. Or two, have them in advance write down what they want to say. Have them read it once and you've got that all down for voiceover. Then drop the piece of paper and have them tell them to say in their own words what they had just written down. And that gives you your own camera. So those are, those are two techniques. 
I became involved in the street life at an early age, 12 years old to be exact. Let's see what else we got here. Okay, here's another tutorial uh, that has a it's kind of a funny guy doing his interview techniques. <laughs> There it is. There's our second angle. So, I put the camera on this side for a very specific reason. If I were to put the B camera, the second camera, on this side of the interviewer, it would cross the line. On one of the shots, should be looking camera right. On the other shot, should be looking camera left. I know this because I've made that mistake. It's just like a movie. You gotta keep the 180 degree rule with an interview. This is a very typical kind of setup for us. Two cameras, a key light, a bounce, a little bit of texture in the background, and a backlight. This kind of framing for an interview isn't going to raise any eyebrows for any clients. No one's going to say, wow, this is such a creative image. This looks like a standard interview. To achieve the depth of field that you see here, I purposefully moved her quite a ways away from the background. She's a good 20 feet away from that back wall. You don't want to film somebody against a flat wall. There won't be any depth. No matter how big your sensor is, no matter how low your f-stop is, you want to pull somebody away from that background. Let's talk about why I feel like this image works for me. The reason why I know it's a good image is because my eye immediately goes to her eyes. The reason why this is happening is because her face is the brightest part of the image. It also has the most contrast and there are leading lines that are pointing me to her face. Depth of field. Field. You know, depth of field is just one more thing to, to, to separate the subject from the background. You can separate the subject from the background by having it go darker or having it go lighter or having it go fuzzy uh, and soft. Uh, the best way, best way to get depth of field is to use a DSLR camera that has a lens and you can, you know, bring the subject closer to the camera and then um, you can, f the background becomes softer and out of focus. If you're using a smartphone, it is kind of hard to have the background go soft and out of focus. Uh, and most of you will use a smartphone, so that's why you have to choose your background colors, you know, Choose your background. Not too busy, not busy. You know, the face should stand out. Okay, uh, let me also talk about sound bites in terms of. Um, Here's, let's look at this little promo that I did for, uh, I'm artistic director of Pioneer Playhouse. I did a promo uh, for one of our plays, Death Trap. Death Trap, a thriller in and, two acts. You know, promo is going to use B-roll from the actors performing, and then I'm going to very quickly shoot a few quick Miami interviews. Doris Crane. Willard Peterson. But bam, it comes Willard back from the grave. One of the things I like about this play is it's the first time I, I've ever had a, a, a chance to play a villain. You're not going to take it away from me! Okay, so this the sound bites that I use of the actors are just a little bit of a little part of their interview. There are some big action physical bits. Uh, part of me likes them because I'm losing weight doing this role. And the other part of me uh, dislikes them because I'm an old man and I'm worn out after the performance. Um, you know, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the clips of the entirety of the interview. Okay? So here is the entirety of the interview. 
So who are you and what does Death Trap mean to you? Well, uh, I'm Eben French Maston, but I play Sidney Brule. And uh, <laughs> what Death Trap means to me is, first of all, learning a lot of lines. And second of all, uh, it is one of the most uh, interesting characters. Uh, he's nice, he's mean, he's devious, he's, he's sneaky, he's charming. Uh, he's all of those things wrapped into one uh, sick soul if, uh, of a human being. Tell me about if you think there's some big action physical bits and do you like those? Um, there are some big action physical bits. Uh, Part of me likes them because I'm losing weight doing this role, and the other part of me dislikes them because I'm an old man and I'm worn out after the performance. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you a 50-50 on that. I like, I like it and I don't like it. Right. Uh, how many seasons have you been here at Pioneer Playhouse? Uh, this is my 20th year here at the Playhouse. It's one of those things where you, you're exhausted when you go home, but then uh, after most of the year goes by, uh, you start thinking, gee, I, I really like to go back. There's something about the place besides the plays and the people and the, and the new interns and apprentices that you get to work with. There's just, there's, it's addicting. That's all I can say. This place is addicting. Okay, so when I edited in the little sound bites of this older actor, the one with the mustache, uh, this is kind of what you do in modern documentary technique. You kind of pop it in, pop it out. I, I consider editing to be like panning for gold. And you have to kind of shake it, what works. And, I, I, you know, you're trying to get gold nuggets to come out and you're trying to get rid of the bad stuff. And to me, the editing process is like that. It's like you try it, you take it out. But, you know, in a, in a short, quick promo, you want things that pop. So I just showed you how I filmed longer statements from the actor, but I'm looking for the things that pop. So this first thing that pops with the older actor is... He talks about there are some big physical action bits. And then I don't continue with his interview. I go pop right to an action scene that demonstrates what he says. You know, so I was like, short, there are some action bits. Go to the action. Then I have his voice come in as voiceover. And then I'll let that voiceover lead us to the on camera. Doing this role. Same thing, a little bit of a sound bite, then back to the B roll. And, the other part. and then the same thing, I start his voice, I pushed his voice over back for the action B roll, and then I bring his voice in just as voiceover. Me, I dislike him because I'm an old man and I'm worn out after the performance. So I, I bring back in that sound bite of I'm an old man and I'm worn out after the performance. Because humor kind of works, particularly in these short promo pieces. You know, you're trying to pop in with these short little sound bites. Uh, you know, so it's like there is action in this piece. Show the action. Uh, I'm, you know, getting feeling older. I'm an older man. Show some action. And part of me is like really old, you know, and you come back to him. So I'm popping this in. I'm not just... Voice over, voice over, voice over, voice over. There's cuts in the voice over, if that makes sense. So again, uh, when you're editing your documentaries and putting your talking heads into your B-roll, it's like panning for gold. You keep kind of shaking it to see what pops, what pops out. And if it's short form content that you're creating and, you, and your documentaries are three minutes, you really don't necessarily want three minutes of solid wall-to-wall -wall voiceover. Uh, you know, the professional, uh, sh you know, short form documentary has things that pop. Look for the sound bites of your talking head. Um, you know, pop them in, pop them out. Short little bits that make sense. Uh, short little bits that uh, make us laugh. Short little bits that make us smile. Um, and we get a taste and we get a sense of who the characters are when all of this merges together in the editing. So uh, I hope you found these tutorials helpful. 
Um, go forth and make great media. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Um, and I look forward very much to seeing what you guys come up with. So bye for now.